It's a terrible sales pitch for my own product here, but something that we talk a lot about is you know, founder kind of gut feel, right? You should, I think, try to trust your gut sometimes. And you're that close to customers. I don't, I don't know that you need to go big into analytics. A product's not gonna be for everyone. Right. You have two products with identical value outcomes from the feature. If their interfaces are different, you're gonna have customers that be like, I hate this product and I like this product, right? <laughs> Having that conversation initially with your co-founders, if you have them, or your team to say who's responsible for what, and then how are you personally going to make sure that you're fulfilling that role. If I'm being honest, of course, yeah, I've had moments where I'm going like, what are we doing? You know, like we want to run back into the little walled garden that is. Yeah. First of all, I'm, I'm trying to figure out when we actually first met, when we actually first talked, not met, because we never actually met <clears throat> in person. Yeah, first time that we talked. Uh, were you on like Chris Cook's marketing roundtables? Never. No? So that's not it. I was too good for that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't need any marketing. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I feel like but, you know, in, the, in that Atlassian space, there, there are a few people that you kind of just yeah. knew, right? And you were one of those. Uh, when did, when did you start Jexo? Back in 2018. It was 18. Okay. Yeah. So, I don't think it was that long after you, you started. So I know you and, um, a couple of other amazing folk from Proforma. That's where I managed to, and, uh, yeah, I've learned about what you do and the team and the, there and so on. So I think that's kind of the first time we met, but we also live in a, I mean, used to live, at least from my end, because um, I'm not in the Atlassian ecosystem anymore, <laughs> um, in, in a world where everyone kind of knows everyone, although they might have not met in person. Yeah, there's a lot of that. Yeah, true. So, well, let's start with an introduction. Uh, what is it that you do, Peter? Uh, we're starting a product analytics company and uh, it's actually, I'll keep the story kind of short, but uh, we, years ago at Proforma, Think Tilt, we wanted a way to understand how, <clears throat> excuse me, how our customers were actually using our products and we found it really difficult. You've been in the Atlassian space, they don't give you a whole lot of data, mm -hmm. right, about who's using your products, how they're using it, all that sort of stuff. So we went looking for solutions to that and we found this product called Sherlock and got to know the founder, Derek, who's actually here in Austin with us. So we brought him down oh, really? um, to help with this this week. And uh, so pumped to meet him. Uh, but we were we were customers of this product called Sherlock and we we kept trying to make it do things it wasn't really built to do. Uh, it's a product led sales tool. It's meant to kind of take intent signals from how customers are actually using your, your product and feed that into HubSpot, Intercom, that sort of thing as uh, product-led sales or product-led growth. And we really wanted it to tell us how our new features were doing, what kind of impact that latest release had on engagement or activation, et cetera. And so we kind of hammered Derek for a while. <laughs> like, make your product do something it wasn't built to do. Uh, and then last year, 2023, uh, we found out that uh, Sherlock had been acquired, but the acquiring company was going to sunset the product. And so we got in touch with Copper CRM who had bought it and just made them an offer to take it off their hands. So we've got the IP now and taking it back to market. And we are now, we have the opportunity to make it do what we want, um, which is a, a bit broader. It's not just product led sales now. It's, um, as I mentioned before, just when you have a new product launch, a new release from that date of change, what impact has that had on your customers, on revenue, churn, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's event-based product analytics with, with a bit of a twist that we're excited to, to talk about this week. You know, when you, you told me, you told me the story, you told me about Sherlock and you told me that you guys bought IP and stuff. And I find it so interesting. And it, it also makes me realize what small of a world we live in because we were trying out Sherlock back in 2019. Mm. 2019, 2020, I think it might have been closer to 2020. And it was an amazing tool. Um, 
I think for us, we, like yourself, there were some things that we couldn't track, which are, look, that we found it, well, you know, um, would love to also have this, the ability to do this and this and that. Um, I think it also made us realize, and we had a kind of like a pivot at that point where we decided to take a step back and be a bit more minimalist when it comes to tracking in the early days. Because mm -hmm. the one thing that I've noticed is, especially with companies that do um, product lead, they try to throw everything at um, their strategy. Yeah. Right. It's like, okay, well, product lead means this. And um, we need to track all of these things where in reality, when you're starting out and your product is small and you have a small customer base and you have a very specific strategy to go to market, do you need to be tracking all kinds Everything. of metrics and so on? But it seems like, and we were doing this because Nikki and I were thinking, well, let's do product led properly. You know, we want to we wanna have our product talk, talk for us but we need to track all of these things. And we've done courses. Um, Wes Bush is, um, is in, in Austin this week yeah. as well for SaaS talk. And I remember doing Wes's course. He had a course on um, uh, CX. Yes, so yeah, and, I remember that one. Yeah, and, and we've done that course and we were like, okay, so we need to take this framework and split it like this and set up all of these processes and set up all of these tracking metrics. And I remember us looking at, um, uh, Sherlock. It was quite expensive for us at, at that point as well because we were the startup. We didn't. We were bootstrapped. We didn't have money for it and so on. Um, and I think that the fact that it was it was a wonderful tool that was hitting the points. Right. Uh, there were some things that we didn't have in there, but also added to with the fact that the pricing was quite steep for us. Mm. Um, we decided. But hold on. What are we doing? Let's break for a second. Do we even need at this stage of, of where we were, we had Swan Lee, our um, release management app, yeah. and I think we launched our second app. And we, we were thinking, well, we can start smaller and gradually grow from, uh, grow from there. And I think that was way better of a strategy of us putting that break and just figuring out what is the minimum that we need yeah. at that stage. Because even these things, I think, I don't know how you're doing um, 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 a coil. How, how do you pronounce it? <laughs> Product name, a, a, a coil? I'm going to have a word with Simon about this. A coil, yes. A coil. Yeah. Um, I'm going to ask you about the, 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 <laughs> the meaning of that word and where okay. did that come from? Because I know you have a story there. Um, but um, you're probably looking at this with your product as well is, things take time to set up properly. Mm -hmm. And not just the product itself, but also how you organize your team, your um, processes and all of that stuff. So yeah. it, it takes a lot Everything of Everything around it, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So I think that's that uh, you have to have a proper buy-in and you have to have a proper need for something really well put together yeah. and, and, and complex. So yeah, but uh, I, I both Nikki and I loved Sherlock. We also liked their branding and the application and so on. So yeah, yeah. So did we. I, and you know, being customers of it ourselves, yeah, I, I really like the product. I think you make a really good point in that when you're a small team, yeah, you have to pick and choose where you basically put your energy, right? And what we found, it's actually it's nice to hear you say that because what we've really found is that I I, I think. The sweet spot for a product like Sherlock, a coil, is actually slightly larger companies, not that small, mm. tiny startup right. where yeah. you're stretched thin as it is already. Um, so slightly bigger companies with a bit more revenue, a bit more momentum behind you, and you really want to sort of ramp that up. Something that we talk a lot about is, you know, founder kind of gut feel, right? And as, as a product owner, you're always going to rely on that, or you should, I think, Try to trust your gut sometimes. Oh yeah, right. Not always, and you're not going to get it right every time. But when you're smaller, especially, and you're that close to customers, I don't, I don't know that you need to go big into analytics, right? It's a terrible sales pitch for my own product here, but, but the reality I mean, is, you like, know your. The thing is, you, you know your your market. You know what your your um, basically perfect customer persona is, and and I think that's some advice that you would give every single 
product organization and I am as well is don't try to sell to people that don't need your, yeah. your product, yeah. right? Sell to your focus on your perfect customer persona and you know, then you're going to have a harmonious business in the sense, yeah. rather than trying to jamming. And we were doing this at Jigsaw as well, which was, well, you know, if, if someone would come in and they, they would have this very complex setup and they would need this and this and that, would, literally I would sell, tell the, the, the lead, you don't need Swanley, mm -hmm. go and use big picture because it's more fit for you, for right. example. Yeah. Right? Um, and I think that's that honesty and that transparency and just being, you know, not trying to just get every single conversion, uh, even if it doesn't make sense, makes you a better product. Yeah, hundred percent. I'm with you. So right. So you know, who you're you're targeting um, bigger um, organizations or SMEs. Sort of, sort of that, size. like where we're really thinking the the perfect fit is um, sort of let's say ten to fifty employees, maybe up to like ten million in revenue, and you really want to ramp it up from there. So yeah. you have someone who can pay attention to your analytics, right? And what we're trying to do is make it a lot less complicated to, to, to get started and to actually use your analytics. So when you mentioned before, like this, this, this tidal wave of event data coming out of your products, we don't think that you need to track all of that. We think that you can pick the things that, you can pick the events that actually mean something to your customers and to you. What, like, what does activation really look like? What is adoption really look like? You don't need to track every single thing that's happening in your product because some of them, you know, if you're weighting them on a scale of like zero to 10, might be a one or a two. And so right. why, why dwell on those things? So I think there's a way to right size your analytics, but it's, you need to have the people with the capacity to do it. Yeah. And at a, again, at a small startup, that may not be the case. And you're also that much closer to your customers, you know, when it's, it's a team of three, let's say, yeah. and you are just getting going, your revenue is just getting kicked off. You can talk to customers, you know, it's a lot easier than, I don't know, I, I don't think any of us do it enough, but you know, you're just a lot closer. So you can actually hear them tell you, <laughs> like, what are we doing in, our, in your product? Here's how we use it. You get your use cases directly from them. You don't have to necessarily look at how they're using it yet, because they'll tell you that. And then the bigger you get, the more removed you get. And um, that's when I think the analytics tools really come into their own. Where does the product sit in the, you know, customer success team stack mm -hmm. of, of tooling? Does it replace Mixpanel? Um, is it a replacement from, for Pendo? Does it sit somewhere in between these? I'd say somewhere in between. And uh, something that we talk a lot about is, you know, is it, is it an all or nothing sort of thing? And what we've settled on recently is that you can actually, we can coexist with Mixpanel, we can coexist with Pendo. I think like Pendo is a great product. It's also big, you know, and again, going back to that, that team size, if you don't have someone to run that product, then you're probably not going to get the value out of it that you need. Where we're trying to be different in the analytics space in particular is letting you, you control what the analytics what, what the scoring looks like and kind of answer that so what question. And where we see a lot of the, the analytics tools just track everything, right? And they'll give you, you know, this event happened 10,000 times, but you kind of go, so what? Yeah. And on the back of that, so what, if you can answer that, which I think we're, which is what we're trying to help people do, just answer that, so what, what does that mean for our customers? For us, our approach is a bit different in that. We think that teams are already using HubSpot, you're already using Intercom. So we're gonna put that data there where you're already using it. So I think tools like Pendo are great. Um, Vitaly for, for CS teams, you know, great products, nothing bad to say about them at all. I just think we've, we've taken a bit of a different approach to how you can use and leverage your, your event data. And that's kind of being like the data hub. And then you can then use a coil to tell your customer comms tools now is the right time to reach out. Yeah, uh, either get conversions, reduce churn, that sort of stuff. I think that's one of the things that I think I know for sure that that's one of the things that um, the features that appealed to us quite a lot back in 2020 um, around Sherlock was the so what because mm. it gives you the scoring. Yep. And 
especially if you're if you're a team that that's just implementing some sort of customer success um, product led strategy, you need the all the help that you can get. So if you can have an expert there that's holding hands right with you and yep. and and guiding you through stuff, and that's in the form of a software as a service, amazing. Hmm. Like I. Um, I remember us using uh, ProfitWoe. Oh yeah, bit. like ProfitWoe is so, like compared to some of the other tools for churn and retention and um, um, kind of like MR, MRR, ARR. What I liked about it, apart from the fact that it was completely free, <laughs> we're a small startup <laughs> that, that bootstrap yeah. uh, startup, but it it would ask you to provide it data in a very specific way. And then you already had all of the dashboards yeah. presented. Yeah, that makes it a bit more rigid. But for someone starting out in tracking churn, track, tracking retention and things like that, this is very helpful. Yeah. Um, so that's uh, th th that's why I compare it to ProfitWell because um, Sherlock was doing that quite a bit. And it sounds like these, you're, you're, you're um, chasing the so what yeah um answering that question for for customers yeah and we were I, I think i looked at profit well every day for years like probably even on the weekends so yeah big fan of profit well um, but yeah to your point like that's what we're trying to do with a coil is answer that so what and then allow you to do something with that not just have the answer in your head but so what it's so what so over here in the tools that we already use the teams are already using Here's how we're going to engage with our customers. Yeah. And you're at, uh, we're, we're actually in Austin at Sastok as well. And uh, you have a booth here as well. Like, it was a last minute booth. Yeah, well. Th talk to me about that because you also launched really recently, wasn't it? We are, we are sort of in the process of a slow burn launch here, but right. uh, it's actually your fault that we're here. Uh, <laughs> Guilty. <laughs> um, but uh, getting involved with Sastok was, was, Great. So I have to say thank you for that. Um, yeah, we, we joined the startup program. And then so we have a growth booth. So just a little table. Mm -hmm. But it was a really great way to get involved. And I mean, you know, we're here to sell a product. This is like the perfect place to do it. It's all the right people. Uh, the energy of it has been fantastic. And the, the onboarding as, as someone, as a company getting involved in the startup program, but also sponsoring, I guess, uh, has been fantastic. So yeah, this is this is a really exciting week for us. I mean, this is like meeting the market for the first time, really. Like we've been to a few events and talked to customers and potential partners, but I th and I think through that process, we've been refining the way that we're talking about it. And this week is kind of I think this is the the test now. The test is, bed for yes, yeah. So do people understand what we're talking about? Yeah, yeah. So how dialed in are we? Yeah. Which we're never going to get it hundred percent right, right? But I think that's the test this week. But that's, it's a, I, I love that process. I'm, um, you know, mentioned that I'm starting a company as well in, in the creative space and so on. And this is probably one of my favorite um, segments of, of launching, which is basically refining the communication and, and how you present your UVP. Because mm. in the early days, when you start having calls with people and saying, oh, I'm doing this, it sounds so rough, so unpolished. And as you talk to more people, it gets more and more refined. And when you feel like you you reach that point where you're such a smooth talker <laughs> about your product, right? And also on the other on the other side, you get the aha and the 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 glimmer in yeah. someone's eyes on oh wow, I need this or I understand this, and this is amazing. I think that's uh, for, at least for me, that's a very rewarding moment in the in the launch path of a of a product yeah so we were we were in las vegas was it last week two weeks i don't even know anymore it's been the it's been a big trip uh so in las vegas for atlassian's team event mm. same sort of thing wasn't the necessarily like the ideal customer base for us there but yeah having those having the, that opportunity to interact with people and then when someone leans in you know, you get that look or something, yeah. you know, the eyebrows go up or some sort of look in the, the, yeah, like you said, a glint in the eye. It's almost addictive. I'm like, oh, I want to try that again. That line worked. And, you know, you yeah. kind of make your notes and you go, okay, that's, that's now part of my pitch. And you just, yeah, it's so much fun to do that. And when you see people 
kind of get excited about what they can do with your product. It's yeah, it's a bit addictive. I'll, I'll, I'll admit. It is. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it is 100%. I'm curious, do you find the talking about Sherlock helpful in those discussions? Right, because there's a there's a story there, right? I mean, the, so, the past. Yeah, the sort past. Of, yeah, yeah. Sherlock was quite notorious. Like, I mean, if I suppose if I know about Sherlock and you just bought the IP of it, it's not. It wasn't like an obscure tool. It, yeah, it grew at one point to to certain notoriety. Yeah. So, do you find that you talking about um, Sherlock, the fact that you have the IP of the platform, um, is a positive in those conversations mm -hmm. let me put the or as okay. well <laughs> because i can see a, a a downside of this as well yep. and do you get many comments of or let's not say comments people people are not that good at giving you telling you what they think right but it can come across from when some when you're talking to someone um is ha, has it been at any point someone thinking, oh, well, if they sunset the tool, why are you buying a sunset tool? It, yeah. it, it, does it does it not mean that it wasn't that successful or it wasn't that needed if they sunset it, right? Because you know. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You know I've, what I'm that's saying. happened. Yeah, plenty. Yeah. Uh, so far, it's been helpful to explain it, and the reason is like talking to you yeah. a couple months ago when you said like, oh, we used that, and so there's this connection there. That's happened more times than I thought it would, which has been really encouraging. Uh, just random conversations with people at, at, at some of these events or just sort of through networks and whatnot and that people go, oh yeah, I use Sherlock. Mm -hmm. And that number has continued to grow. So that's been really encouraging and everyone has good things to say about it. So it's in including myself, like I, yeah. I really like the product. So explaining, yeah, they got acquired and then the acquiring company sort of let the product go. Yeah, how do you explain that? I, I think we've found that it's not as big of a deal as, as maybe we were first worried about, right? So it was a bit of a concern. It's like, do we talk about that or not? Uh, it's been a, more of a net positive than not to share that story. I think very quickly though, that will change. And this week we're probably, this may be the last week here at SAS Talk to talk about it because we mm -hmm. Derek's here with us, Derek being the founder of Sherlock. Yeah. Um, and he's here to help us talk to people about their product data at, at large as well, not just about you know, the product that he had built. So I think following this week, we're probably going to start dialing that down and right. say, this, there's a new story here. We don't need to go into that and introducing it to new, a whole new market. I think, um, we're kind of, kind of make that pivot now. So yeah, fair question. Uh, it's definitely. That, that's weighed on my mind a lot. Like, how do we message around that without it seeming like, oh, this thing was dead. Why would you, why would I want it? The, the thing, the, the reason why I was also curious is because um, not necessarily the stigma of, of something being buried. Because I know we, we also live in a world, especially in SaaS software as a service and, and technology in general, where there's so many examples of companies buying other companies and yeah. just closing down the product that they originally had, maybe took some parts, took the team and so on. So I would expect your answer to be the answer that you gave me, which is not a lot of people care, hmm. right? Because it's so such a standard thing nowadays yeah. to, to, it, to happen because it doesn't necessarily mean that the product was terrible and no one wanted it because I don't think that's the case. Um, but, you know, companies have different strategies and that's why every single time I'm using a tool and the company acquires that tool, I'm thinking, oh, please yeah. give me at least a version of this. Even if you close the doors of this, give me something else yeah. so I can continue to use. Well, you've, you've been through it. I mean, and oh, we yeah. went through it with Think Tilt and Proforma as well, where everybody has great ideas and great plans, right? Like this is where they, we're going to integrate this. It's going to be a beautiful thing. And then reality comes into the picture and it's not as easy either technically or staffing it up is difficult or the company changes strategic direction, which is kind of what happened with the Sherlock product that, you know, at some point say change of leadership or whatever, you know, that someone just decides like, nah, like 
seemed like a good idea at the time. That's not where we need to be heading right now. Oh, well, yeah. you know, sort of a sunk cost kind of thing. Um, so I don't know if, if, if integrations and acquisitions ever go as smoothly as everyone wants them to. And that's just the reality of it, right? That there's, there's always more friction than you think there's going to be in this sort of like kumbaya experience of it'll all just sort of fit. And that's not always the case. So yeah, I think there's a lot of expectation and, and uh, around that reality that, yeah, this may go well, it may not. <laughs> but often those products do kind of go away at some point, right? Where either integrated in or just sort of, yeah, directionally but change their mind. I also think that it's, you know, it's not that often that you hear um, buying the IP of a, um, a, of a tool and that that's quite interesting and intrigues me. There's definitely probably value there and you guys have a, um, a, a strong strategy uh, to bring a really good product to market um, because otherwise you wouldn't have done it, right? You would have yeah. just b built something off the yeah. ground. So there is a significant core there um, and principles. And I guess that's why you're also, is, is Derek, is, is he an, an advisor or? Yep. Um, yeah, just an advisor with us at the moment. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so he's off doing his own thing, but yeah, he's uh, including, he's, he's built a product data masterclass, which is just great. Like if, if this is not shilling his course here, but just mm -hmm. if anyone wants to understand how product data actually works or like the best way to implement it, he's teaching that now. Um, so he's got his, he's got plenty of his own stuff going on, but he was yeah, gracious enough to share his time with us, which has been super helpful. He's a, he's a great guy, really uh, up meeting him for the first time here as well uh, in person. But yeah, it's nice to have someone with that depth of experience just around and probably well, asking lots of stupid questions. Uh, tomorrow when I'm at uh, the expo, I'll, I'll, I'll see if I can, uh, he's going to be at your booth. Yep. I'll, I'll come by, um, see if he recognizes me. I think we had one or two calls back in yeah. 2020 when he was uh, <laughs> pitching us uh, share look and so on. definitely great. doesn't recognize me he's been he probably been having thousands and thousands of demos since you never then. know <laughs> you never know. know maybe i have a very uh, familiar face um right i want to talk a bit about your history as an entrepreneur as a founder so i don't know much pre um, Proforma, you were working at Proforma, um, you weren't part of the co-founding team. Correct. Yeah, I was not. Yeah. So you're working with them. Tell me a bit about your history before that. What, yeah, what, where, to, where to start? What kind of uh, odd jobs have you done? <laughs> I've done a lot of odd <laughs> jobs. I've, yeah, like literally plenty of odd jobs. Uh, I guess uh, like to keep it somewhat related to, to where we're at today, uh, I, I got into management consulting. Uh, shortly after graduating from college and primarily worked in government space. I was a journalism student, so I was brought in to write stuff and I would write requests for proposals and all sorts of, just a lot of writing. And that ended up taking me to Saudi Arabia on a project there and I uh, just got exposed to a lot of different cultures and stuff, including like technology and, and stuff like that there. Uh, fast forward a couple of years, we left, left Saudi and decided to do something a bit stupid and crazy, perhaps bought a carpet cleaning business, as you do, uh, on the Gold Coast in Australia. So clean carpets on boats and hotels uh, for a couple of years and had a crew that doing that. Sounds profitable though. It, it's a profitable business. It's a lot of work. I lost a lot of weight doing it. It's the like best exercise ever. So uh, you, before, you were you were doing I was the, doing the it because I, I, I knew nothing about it. So I thought the best way to learn this and the way that I can manage other people doing it is to just do it myself. So I, I yeah. cleaned carpets for 12 months and there's way more to know. I won't go into the details of it, but it's actually, there's a whole lot of science behind it and the chemicals and all that sort of stuff, which fascinated me. Um, sold that business and on the back of, of learning how to, to grow that business and promote that business, I, I thought I'd, I'd team up with a, a friend and start a or joined a marketing agency as a partner at this marketing agency. And we worked with clients ranging from hypnotherapists to fleet management companies to just broad range of things. And um, how I ended up really in where I am now is I was giving a talk at a HubSpot user group and Simon, who's now a co-founder at Acoil, was one of the co-founders at, at ThinkTilt. 
uh, took advantage of the Q&A session after my talk. And so there I am standing on stage, go to Q&A, and you know, these, these events, sometimes you don't get it. many questions, mm -hmm. sometimes you get a, a bunch. And it just so happened this one night, there's this guy in, in the crowd who like, like doesn't give the mic to anybody else. <laughs> can just oh, that answer, sounds like just Simon. <laughs> peppering me with questions. I'm on stage, you know, it's lights. And there's just this guy that I've never met in the audience just asking me, like grilling me. Just another question, another question, another question. I'm going, and I'm sitting up there thinking like, well, it's this guy, you know, <laughs> what are we doing here, people? And eventually got off the stage, had a chat. And then within a couple of weeks, uh, was asked to go and work with the Think Tilt team. So joined Think Tilt as one of, I think we were 12 people by the, by the time we got acquired. So it's still a small crew, ostensibly in marketing, but spent my time doing support, sales, pre-sales, solutions engineering, you name it. We kind of did all the things. And then uh, Think Tilt got acquired by Atlassian in 2021. And then spent some time in Atlassian, two years there, getting to know that and see what that looks like on the other side, oh, yeah. <laughs> which was, yeah, eye-opening, great people, um, and a great experience. And then came out of came out of Atlassian and decided to team up with the Think Tilt crew again. So Kate, Simon, and myself are giving it another go, and we've brought back a few other Think Tilters as well. So they'll be publicly announced in the not too distant future. But yeah, so it's exciting. We're kind of getting the band back together. You were working for Think Tilt, and now you're kind of like on the other side of the fence. You're part of the co-founding team. Yeah. Did anything change? Is 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 it different? Yeah, it's different. But I, I think what what attracted me to working with with Kate and Simon again was the the nature of the relationship in the past, and got along very well. Still get along very well. I think we've we've found a way to work together where there's it's very open. And if you have an opinion on something, if you don't want to do something, or you, you feel strongly about it, it's, we can put it all on the table. So there's a really strong relationship there. And that was the case as an employee, um, just as it is now, I think, obviously, I've got a bit more, you know, heft that I can throw around, I can actually make decisions and instead of suggestions now, but, yeah. but by and large, it's, it, it hasn't changed that much. So a bit more responsibility on my shoulders. I guess that's the nice part about being an employee, right? You can kind of go, oh, well, you made a bad decision. <laughs> <laughs> Even though you're a sweetheart. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, there's, there's more responsibility, uh, but that uh, I think has made it a bit more fun. Mm -hmm. So having a seat at the table, I guess has been, it's been enjoyable, but I, I don't think the nature of how we work together has changed much. How did this come, come across the three of you partnering up? Was it something that happened over time of, oh, you know, now that Think Tilt um, has been acquired and we're kind of like free agents after a while with, with um, um, Atlassian, um, you know, maybe one day we should partner up, we should uh, start our own thing. Or was this something that was spontaneous? How, how, did, how did it all happen? So the, the idea for this product analytics product for a coil it never actually died. And it's kind of something that we, we kept talking about, even while we're at Atlassian, it wasn't necessarily saying, hey, we're going to go build this thing, but you're still working its ass, still looking at the same, trying to get the same signals out of your product. And Simon in particular, being on the, the product management team at Atlassian and trying to uh, steer the way, <clears throat> excuse me, steer how Proforma was being integrated into to Jira wanted those same signals. So it was something that we kept talking about because we'd been discussing it as a, with our own product. And then even at Atlassian, you, you still have the same questions. It's like, what, how do I justify my roadmap? And so it's, it's an idea that never sort of died, but it wasn't necessarily, yes, in two years, we're going to go do this thing. Uh, so it, fully open here. Uh, so Kate and I actually got laid off from Atlassian. We were in that round in what last year sometime yeah so, uh, people that I got let go yeah. and so i got the email saying you know you're basically like you're done uh close your laptop send it in or whatever and the first person that called me was kate and i answered the, the phone and i just I go hey kate and all i hear is laughter just laughing <laughs> <laughs> how about this 
And how did you feel like you were you was was it contrasting her her reaction to it versus yours when I, I look I think I think getting laid off let go being made redundant whatever you want to call it is a bit confronting no matter what right even if yeah. I'd say even if you, you 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 don't feel like this company is the best fit for you you kind of want to do everything on your own terms I do anyway I want to make sure that I'm the one that sort of says like no it's, it's like I uh, know you can't fire me I quit you know like yeah. I would suggest that, but, uh, you know, so you want to be the one that controls it or I do. Yeah. And so in that way it was really confronting, right? It's like the control has been taken away from me. Time for you to go. Uh, I've been thinking about leaving and you know, it's, it sounds like I'm trying to make excuses here and sort of make this seem better than it was. Like I was let go. That's fine. It hurt a bit. It definitely hurt. It was a, it was a, a sting and a bit of a blow on the ego, but after the dust settled, it felt like the right thing. And so what happened was Kate and I, after the laughter died, uh, decided, you know, we, we'd like to work together. And so we went, basically uh, hung our shingle up and went to the Atlassian Marketplace vendors and said, hey, we can help you grow your business. So we did some consulting for about a year. And over the course of that time, that's when we started talking to Simon about, you know, hey, maybe we should get back together and, and do something. And then now like coming full circle back to that Sherlock story, the only reason that we knew that Sherlock was available was I just happened to look up the Sherlock website one day and it's the same day that they'd put up a notice saying that we're taking it down. Right. Uh, and that was sort of like the moment of let's go do that. You know, I think just everything fell into place. It felt like, all right, well, we've got the team. Mm -hmm. We know each other. Let's go. And off we went. So did you knew anyone at Sherlock or the, the, um, the acquired acquiring company? Yeah. So, um, so it was copper CRM that, that, copper CRM. that bought Sherlock. Yeah. And, uh, we, we just kept in touch with Derek and so saw the website say, we're taking this product down, flick Derek a note. And that's how right, we got yeah. introduced to copper to have that conversation. So, um, so yeah, knew Derek loosely, you know, having been, customers of his yeah, in the past, using... uh, similar to yourself, right? Like, yeah, yeah you kind of like, will he remember us? But um... I would have probably considered if I would have been on that page in the same day that they put the announcement as you did, I would have probably really considered um, reaching out to Derek and seeing if uh, if that product it was, his, it, was, it was his idea. He sort of nudged us in that direction. Actually. Really? It was more of a consolation, uh, you know, hey, hey, Derek, sorry to see that they've you know, the decision was made to take this thing down, which is too bad because it's your baby, right? Yeah. And uh, he, it was his idea. Like, maybe you should, maybe you guys should have a look at that. Yeah. So I would have probably been a bit more evil in that sense. And as soon as I saw that, I'd be like, hey, Derek, do you know the Kong base is available for us? <laughs> yeah. So that's how, that's how that came to be. And that's how Kate, Simon, and I uh, sort of formalized that, that working agreement or whatever you want to call it. Um, Interesting. So you, this is your first ever product baby uh, thing that you yeah. are owning, yeah. that you are a founder of. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And how does it feel? Is it uh, uh, stressful? Is it intense? Do you feel yes. like you don't belong? <laughs> <laughs> all of the above all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. I mean, it's, it's, yeah, you swing through all these emotions and I mean, coming, coming to SAS talk, has has brought all of that up for me i'll be honest that like we played in the Alassian world for years yeah very comfortable there mm -hmm. uh don't know everything but at least you know I could, we we were at team in las vegas and you walk around and you, you know people it's like going to you're meeting old friends right yeah so it's very comfortable and think tailed was quite popular at one point so yeah like, yeah oh, people know you already. had a good reputation yeah. and, you know and and i that of course helps everything there. It makes it really easy. Still, you know, having worked at Atlassian, still know a bunch of people on the floor. So that it, it feels easy. Uh, SaaS stock, big bad world of, of B2B SaaS out in the real world, uh, outside of the Atlassian ecosystem definitely has sort of made me sit back and go, okay, are we ready for this? And it is scary. I, yeah, it is scary. And, and this is one of the things that I've, Look, we've never actually, I mean, we launched a standalone product 
the late years of Jexo, which was Goose Deep, the, yes. the road mapping, right. but we never actually done anything with it. But it's always been quite daunting to me. It feels like a marketplace is kind of like a bit of a safe ground in a sense. Yeah. You know, you can you can cling on certain strategies to make your product um, gain momentum. Yeah. Whereas when you're out there in the desert <laughs> of SaaS businesses, it's a bit more daunting. Yeah. Uh, but I've seen, I've noticed that the same principles apply, which is the reason why SaaS talk um, works so well, the reason why other events like this is because it's pretty much the same, but at a different scale and wider topics, which is if you're part of the SaaS community and you make partnerships and friends and you're there, they're, they're similar like with um, Atlassian world. Yep you get momentum and you get invited to certain things. You talk at this event and, and you slowly building up that reputation for your yeah. product. Yeah. So it's, uh, I think for that reason, it's, it, it's exciting to to kind of step out and, and do that. Uh, but yeah, if I'm being honest, of course, yeah, I've had moments where I'm going like, what, what are we doing? You know, <laughs> like we want to run back into the little walled garden that is, yeah. you know, the Atlassian marketplace, yeah. which I still think is a great place to do business. Um, but we have this product that we can go take it out to a bigger broader market so oh yeah let's go yeah and we also know that you know it's comfortable but there's also a ton of limitations especially mm. with <laughs> plus in <laughs> marketplace yes. and uh, the middleman in between and all of the challenges of not having the visibility that you need uh, over all of the information that you need so that must be a relief now that you have a product where you can plug in whatever tracking and <laughs> yeah. um you know analytics and all of that stuff um so i guess that's that's the benefit and you can do whatever planning pricing um yeah yeah that you need to a lot more flexibility there uh, yeah. we do plan to go into the alaskan marketplace and that's of course causing its own it's it's funny to have that as, as two parts of the business where one is sort of yeah do whatever you want and structure it however you want and the other is this more rigid you're playing by someone else's rules sort of space. Yeah. So figuring out pricing is going to be difficult to try to get parity across those two where, as you know, on the marketplace, you know, you're tied to like Jiri usage. So how do you, how do you square that with a publicly available app that you can price however you want? So yeah, there will be challenges to that, but I don't know. I, I'm excited both ways. I think it's, it's at last it's still a great company to kind of be around and um, so I don't think we're going to, we're not going to like walk away from that by any means, but yeah, it's exciting to kind of step out and have a swing at the, the real, like the big bad market, you know? Oh, yeah. And speaking of uh, question marks and such, what has been so far for you personally, the, the, um, the biggest, let's call it black box when it came to, um, starting into SAS in general, outside the, the ecosystem. Because, uh, you know, there's stuff that applies from Atlassian ecosystem to running a yeah. the loan product and so on. Mm -hmm. But there's also a lot of unknowns. What was that, the one of the biggest unknowns for you that you had to tackle or will tackle? That's a, that's a difficult one to answer, actually. Uh, I think there's, there's just a lot. I, I think what's been interesting is I think if you, if you were to sort of come up with your own product idea and build that, you're there from the, the very start, right? And so I think for me, one of the biggest challenges has been understanding what this, this existing product was and how it was positioned and how, how it was marketed and built and all that sort of stuff. And then how do we actually take that and make it our own? Uh, so that's been a very different, different experience because it's not necessarily you know, I wasn't around when the idea came up and, you know, and, and of course, plenty of people join companies that they're not the creators or the founders or whatever, but having this thing where we're, we're kind of taking it back to market, what, what worked, what didn't work, um, how are we going to go about f figuring that out? I think that's been the, I wouldn't say a black box necessarily. It's just been like, that's something that I spent a lot of time thinking about is do we, how much do we lean on? the history of the product versus how much do we sort of like set a new path for it? And um, like, do we wipe the slate clean? Just say, this is a coil now. Yeah. 
no more Sherlock. You know, everything that we're doing from this point forward is completely new, fresh, and uh, our own. Or how much do we pull forward from from the history that's there? Uh, so that's that's been an interesting one. Uh, otherwise, I feel like, as you said, like on, in the Alaskan marketplace, you're still running a business. You're still operating on on principles, right? Like there are certain ways that you can promote and market and sell a product. So I I don't feel like I'm learning all of that from the start, but it's it's a different it's more challenging. Uh, so maybe that's maybe that's it. So we've we're going into product analytics, which is a pretty red ocean, you know. Oh yeah. Lots of big players, well established, great products already exist in this space. Whereas working in the Alassian ecosystem, you could kind of you could pick an, an, a niche or niche even. Uh, <laughs> however you want to pronounce it. And and you can kind of like claim that ground, right? Yeah. In the in the in that ecosystem where it's a bit easier to kind of say, this is us, we're the only ones doing this over here. And you're kind of in that that ecosystem that's kind of protected a little bit and feels like a bit of a safer place to, to play. So going into product analytics is, maybe that's, that's the thing that kind of makes me sit back a bit is like we've got big competition now. And we're not necessarily trying to go head to head with, with you know, these big tools, but they're out there, people know about them. So I'm doing a lot more uh, addressing that, answering those kind of questions from, from customers in. Right, I'm gonna dig deeper here. Go for it. Um, and I'm gonna ask a different question, structure differently. What is your, today, what is your biggest year around biggest your business? Year. Yeah. I think my, my biggest fear is that we're not going to be fast enough to find that fit. And um, as we've talked about, it, it was a great product, really enjoyed using it. We're making changes to it. So we are kind of changing the direction a little bit and it's based on kind of a scratch your own itch kind of thing. Like this is the direction that we want to take the product is, is to move away from strictly like product led growth, product led sales and, and move it into make it valuable to product teams, make it valuable to engineering teams. So there's, there's a bit of a, we're adding on to it. But with that comes complexity around who are we messaging to, oh. how are we positioning this? Uh, so I guess maybe my biggest fear is that we don't move fast enough in the right direction. You know, with just where's the real traction going to come from? Should we be making these changes at all? You know, because the product work as it was for certain teams. And now we're talking about, you know, we think it can do something more, bigger. Um, so that's, that's the unknown right now. Is that actually going to work? But um, coming to conferences like this is, is, uh, this is why we're here, right? right. So we can, we can so test this is that. your validator. Cause that would, that would have been yeah. my next question is like, how, how do you know, how do you kind of like uh, address that fear? Cause I think that's one of the things that, uh, some founders face, which is, you know, we all have a lot of fears about, you know, our business, especially in the early days. I mean, I did, along the way, there's always some, something that comes up that's like, oh, damn it. What if, what if, yeah. but I think, especially when you, when you start, it feels like those what ifs are not necessarily weightier because you can be a, a founder that's been in business for 20 years and has a hundred million um, ARR or something like that. And that's, you know, you have some questions that are quite weighty, um, but it, it feels like big questions to, to answer. And there's a, there's, there's a bigger fear when you're at, when you're at a stage where you were more established and, and such, and you know that you have something and the product is working and you have that market validation and so on. You have like a big team with a lot of professionals that can help you answer um, or kind of like put those fears to rest. Mm -hmm. A bit different yeah. than when you're in the early days and, you know, it, it's, it's kind of like a make or break uh, moment. And the one thing that I see a split is I, I talk to founders which have these fears, these what ifs, um, and but they don't know how to put those fears 
at ease, right? Okay. Or how to figure out, right? How do I get to the answer of that? How do I yeah. answer? How do I answer this question for me that kind of like itches me and is is a big fear factor yeah. moving forward? Um, whereas talking to people sounds for you, right? It, that's one of the most important things and especially in places like this i suppose that's and that's probably one of the things that you realize is no one knows you here yeah yeah <laughs> and it can be daunting yeah. but in the same time it can do it can be really good for your business yeah because that's when you get the uh, real feedback from and that's people that yeah. don't give a damn about your business yeah 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 and that's ultimately what we're after right and, and but that's also that can be a very scary thing even for established companies i mean it's it's something that that has come up a lot in the past year working with other businesses this is one of those things that uh, probably every single phone call is like well, talk to your customers more yeah i mean it's the it's like the, the get out of the office thing like go go talk to people what are what are they doing how why are they looking to solve this problem what is the real problem what is their workflow and just understanding that and looking for those the, the right angle or the pitch or whatever you want to call it that that makes someone someone's eyes light up like you need to go see that whether it's zoom or in person i think in person's way way better just a stronger connection that yeah. you can actually see it you know you can see someone react to to what you're saying so i it's that to me is like one of those just principal things you just need to go and talk to people and it can be a bit scary you know like i'm not saying i'm i'm great at it but you know you just got to get out and give it a go and if someone walks away thinking like oh that was a bunch of crap they're probably not going to think about you again anyway so like i think that getting that out of my head is has been really helpful in that a lot of these moments are very fleeting right unless they come back and talk to us they're probably not going to think about us again yeah and so there's not this huge weight on my shoulders anymore feeling like what does everyone think about us or product myself you know all that sort of stuff and um that's been very liberating just to kind of go all right like we're gonna give it a crack and if if this doesn't land well we can always we can pivot we can change that uh but yeah getting out and talking to people that's to me that like that's the core of it is really understanding who you're talking to and who you're selling to yeah I, and i think you, you have the right attitude there which is I'm going out there. I don't give a damn whether, I mean, in the sense of I'm not going to have feedback affect me. Yeah. Right. But it's something that I need a lot. Yeah. Right? I need it, but it won't affect us and how we, you know, how we figure out things moving, moving forward, um, an, an emotional reaction or, yeah. um, yeah, because it's very hard. It's very hard to be in, a, in, in an environment where no one knows you and no one cares. And you you go and talk to people and people still don't care or they don't have the reaction that you expected. Yeah, It, it can be demoralizing, demotivating and also hurtful in a hmm. sense. Because you think it's just like... I, didn't do a good job at mm. either presenting the product or at my vision with this product. Yeah. Um, and having the maturity to to not take that to heart and actually say, right, here's the feedback that we got from this expo or whatnot. Let's see what this means for our for our product or our business. How did you how did you handle that? You know, as a as a as a new founder, yeah. How did you handle that? Well, in the early days, it, it was just it was very helpful, especially when we started and we were doing Swanly and we realized we, we were having demos here and there um, and people just didn't have that aha moment. So much so that we almost closed shop okay. eventually, hmm. right? Um, the way we dealt with it was, one, we had a moment where we said, we're going to give it one last try. Um, what did that mean? Like, what was one last try? Like another year or? So we were demotivated that this was happening in um, end of 2018, beginning of uh, 2019. We had launched the product for six months. We had uh, in January 20, um, 
20, uh, 2019, we had our first paying customer. It was an interesting moment. It was like, oh yeah, yay, we can pay for the server of, of for, for Swanley. Okay. But in the same time, it was a, it's still a bitter taste after all of the rejection and the demos and no one got it and no one, it felt like, really? Do you really want to pay for this product? Uh, <laughs> Us, right? Yeah. We we were at that wow. point where, yeah. we, where we were thinking, why is he paying for the product? Because everyone else that that we didn't really hmm. didn't really got it and yeah. didn't commit to it. But then I, we we had a moment where we we said, well, maybe we shouldn't be doing this. But let's see if there's anything that we can do more proactively to change this. And what, what that action was, was to start doing research and, and figuring out what people wanted from this area, which was release management at that mm -hmm. point in the um, Jira and Atlassian yeah. world. So we started doing some digging and we started finding some interesting, you know, requests from, from users of Jira, from Atlassian and so on. And I think that's when we had a bit of an aha moment of, well, we didn't do much custom, like market validation in mm -hmm. our product. You know, we thought that we should be building all of this. No one wants it. But here's, here's a panel of people giving feedback passionately <laughs> yeah. around a, a product. Like, why don't we build that? Mm -hmm. That's the feedback. That, that's what people need. Yeah. Um, and we built a couple of, um, we called it magnet features. Mm -hmm. And then kind of, that kind of changed. We started thinking about, oh, well, if people are posting these, what are they talking about? What are they searching about? Let's start changing our listing to reflect that. And that kind of like had a significant turn. We, it was this, this period at that point where we were excited because we thought we had something, mm -hmm. right? And, and we were excited to explore it. And as we started launching these and seeing results and seeing um, kind of like customers, paying for the product, that was very motivating. When someone, um, when you have a demo with someone and they say, right, I like what you're doing and this fits with my organization, I'm gonna pay for this. Yeah. Then you can have other people, you can be at events and people say, well, I've, yeah, I don't know, I don't think anyone needs this. Well, I don't, I don't, my organization doesn't need this. Like you still know that there's a group of people out there that that uh, find the product useful. Yeah. Right? that kind of like overshadows any other because a product is not going to be for everyone right even if you have the you have two products with identical um, value outcomes from the features if their interfaces are different you're going to have customers that be like i hate this product and i like this product <laughs> right <laughs> yeah although they come to the exact same um, um outcome so we kind of started I wouldn't say zoning out because you can't. All of that feedback you have to take it in. It's 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 analytics. Is it's it's information that you put to good use to work later, right? Oh, five people said the same thing. Okay, maybe we can address this. They didn't like that. We can address it. So we. It's not like you're ignoring the negative feedback. You're still collecting it, but it doesn't affect you yeah. anymore. It's the same thing with you know podcasting and me being a bit more of a public person. So I have people that you know are let's say um, a bit of trolls and so on, and don't, but don't like this or don't like that. Mm -hmm. But because the majority find the podcast that I do or this or that very valuable, like that doesn't mean anything to me. Yeah, anymore. that's good. Yeah. yeah. So I think that's that's how uh, how uh, we got over you know potentially being in a in an awkward position where we're some in a room where no one knows us and you know you just kind of like get because you get that sometimes like people say oh so what do you, is it that you do and they, they kind of like have that lean back stance of, of uh, and raised eyebrow of okay then let me see if this is a good product or not especially at SaaS uh, yeah. events mm. haven't been on the other side at a SaaS talk of um, of being uh, an expose right but there's a lot of people here that are into software as a service, either working for companies or owning companies and so on. So, you know, there there may be from the from the attendees' perspective of a bit more like that 
drilling that because I know I've I've been an, an attendee and I I was going to um, competitors with Pendo or this or that and I'll be like so what what makes you special right like that kind of like <laughs> let me validate Dealing, you yeah, let, me va yeah. let me validate you before <laughs> I talk to you right so you, I don't know you might get some of that here as so. oh yeah yeah I mean that that's been happening at other events too yeah what makes you different yeah it, it, it's funny hearing someone be that blunt with you yeah but I also appreciate it because it means I've got to figure out how to yeah. how to articulate right. that in a way that they stick around and continue to be interested. And uh, as you said, not for everybody all the time. Like there will be people, at, at the Atlassian event, we, we spoke with some pretty big companies and it's like, there's, we know we're not for gigantic enterprises. Right. Like that, that we can, we can stop this conversation right now. Yeah. You know, like we're, we're not a good fit for you. Thanks for coming by. They go to Pendo or yeah, whatever like next door. Just, they, they're can, just there. Yeah, there's other, there's, there are better fit products. And that's fine. I think getting, <clears throat> being comfortable doing that has been really helpful. Uh, because as you said, you know, at the top of the show here, it's just, it's like having that honesty and, and the, the ability, and it's almost like the confidence to say like, not we're, we're not a good fit for you. It's not that we don't want your money. It's we don't need it. And this isn't going to work out for either of us really in the long run. And having the confidence to just say, no, like, go, go talk to them uh, or, or suggest something else or you can walk them over to, you know, a consultant booth and it's like, actually, you just need someone to help you do this. You know, like, just you're there for the greater good, really. And I think that, that helps you play well in the space. But yeah, I'm, I think that's, that's what I'm most excited about this week, really, is just having those conversations and see what questions people come up with because this is going to be a bit different from the Atlassian space where I, I kind of know the questions we're going to get, but here... It may be a bit more pointed. I think I can um, foresee one common question. Mm -hmm. It's going to sound silly, but is people saying, "How do you pronounce your company?" Oh yeah, your yeah, name. Yeah. <laughs> do you think that's going to happen? It it does happen. It does happen it does already. Happen. Yeah. Okay, so tell me the story um, of, around the um, a coil name. So we've talked about Simon. Uh, Simon has, has basically just wanted to name a company this for a long time. And a coil... Uh, <laughs> what does it, what does, it, 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 does it have a meaning? It, does, it, it means to, to gather and bring together. So it, it's actually quite... It's an appropriate name for mm. analytics because you're collecting data and you're making sense of that. Uh, so it makes sense in that way. Uh, but I, the, the name has, has grown on me a lot. I, I like it. I think we can educate people on how to say it, but that, that has been one of the little sticking points over the past couple of months where we've, I've gotten a quill, you know, and I don't know how people look at the letters and get to, it's something that sounds French, you know, yeah, it's, just, yeah. it's just like, that doesn't make any, I don't see that. How did you, how did you get a quill from a coil? I don't know, but yeah, it has come up a few times, but. Well, I guess well, it's a, it's also a um, conversation starter at the end of the day, right? So you, could, uh, you can warm up with uh with a bit of a conversation about uh, the name of the company yeah a and i agree like there have been quite a lot of companies in SaaS as well which had the weirdest name ever um, yeah thankfully we've gotten away from that though right like the like original twitter was like twttr yeah, or something yeah, like yeah. that yeah yeah so it's not uncommon right to have something that um people don't don't really un don't, don't know how to pronounce and i think it might be also non-native English speakers that mm. struggle with this more. Yeah. Right. Could be. And that's, that's the one thing. Cause you know, well, but my, the first draft of our booth that I proposed to the team, mm -hmm. it, it just had the logo and the name. So a coil, a coil analytics. And then the, all the design was it's pronounced ack boil. Yeah. <laughs> if you can ask us anything else you want, <laughs> let's just get this out of the way right now. Yeah, exactly. So I think there's yeah. so we, we may lean into that at some point mm -hmm. if it continues to be a thing, but you know, I like to, I like to sort of like fast forward here and say like, no, everyone's going to know it. It's fine. We'll, we'll do, we'll educate the market. And then here's some confidence for you. Right? Like, I think we'll, we'll be able to make this thing go. And at that point, other people can do it for us. Right. Like yeah. once we, once we establish it as a brand, then off we go. That's awesome. Um, the other thing that, um, I wanted to mention, you know, I said, th this is the first time that you're a, the, the, basically the founder of a product business. 
but does it feel like a novelty for you? Because, you know, just thinking of your history so far in the last few years, you've, you've helped run Think Tilt. You were part of that team when it got acquired. You spent a couple of years at um, Atlassian. You got quite a deep dive into how that entire operation works. Mm. They're a product company. Yeah. Pr previously working for a product company. Does it, you know, does it feel novel or is it, well, I've, I've accumulated all of this knowledge around what it means and what it takes to build a product um, business mm -hmm. that I'm, I feel a, more confident going into it? Uh, look, I, I'm, I'm learning something new every day, right? Like that, that's the reality. Uh, so having, having more responsibility, like overseeing the finances of the company now and owning that, that's, a, that's new. I've, that's new in the sense uh, that this is a product company. So I've owned, owned a number of businesses before, predominantly like more services side. So, uh, you know, managing that is not new. Um, I think where the, the novelty for me is being in this sort of like startup B space where there's sort of expectations that people have when you say like, oh, we're, we're launching a, a software company. And it's like, oh, a startup. And like, <laughs> you can call it whatever you want, but like there's this expectation that that's like, you're going to, you're going to burn fast and hot. And it's like, yeah. you're, you're shooting for the moon. Um, so I, that, that to me is novel where there's these expectations that other people have of you and of the company and the product that it's like, you're going to be the next Google. Like, <laughs> uh, be nice, I guess. But, uh, you know, like, what does startup mean to everyone else? Yeah. And do we even consider ourselves a startup? I don't, I don't know. You know, um, I think we're just trying to build a good product, uh, be sensible with the way that we run it operationally. And in that regard, Kate is a fantastic operator. Simon's a great operator. Uh, I'm, I personally just feel like I'm really blessed and lucky to, to have teammates that have been around the traps a few times and I can learn from them. I think I'll, I'll bring some strengths as well, but yeah, it's, it's a good team. So I'm comfortable. Okay. Always Wait. learning, but comfortable. But you're the baby founder. In, I'm the baby founder now. <laughs> in yeah, this yeah. group. <laughs> There's another t-shirt. Uh, <laughs> I'm bringing it all up. <laughs> You've got Simon the sweetheart, <laughs> baby founder. Yeah. Okay. I mean, to find something for Kate. For Kate, yeah, we'll see what she's, what she allows me to get away with. Yeah. Um, so, well, uh, oh yes, I wanted to ask, because you mentioned, well, are we a startup? Are we, um, are you bootstrap? We are raising right now. So we're raising, raising a small round. Okay. Yeah. And the intent is to do one. Like that's the, that's the thinking right now. Famous so, last word. Famous last word. <laughs> <laughs> so they, if, of anything, that might get me in trouble. Uh, <laughs> yeah. No, so yeah, so we are raising right now, uh, doing a small round um, with the intent of, uh, the idea is to make this a 10-year business at least. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and the reason that's important, uh, to me anyway, and I, th I think collectively, is that we're we're trying to build something that, that can kind of grow on its own momentum, right? Like we want to build a sound business that we're not necessarily looking to flip it and, and run away from it. Right. Uh, so. Like I did. Well, look, I, there, <laughs> I, I have, there is absolutely nothing wrong with any of the approaches. Like there's, there's no judgment on any of it. It's just, I think for, it's kind of one of those things like at this point in my life, do I want to work 80 hours a week? Not really. <laughs> you know, I've got kids, I've got a wife. Got a little farm that we, you know, pretend like we're farming, and uh, okay. you know, so there's a lot going on. When do you have uh, time for this business, though? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, <laughs> I mean, so, so I guess that's what I'm trying to say is like, we, I think we envision this as a more, uh, more stable maybe, and and less uh, like it's frantic kind of life lifestyle business. Um, I don't. I don't know. Profitable. I, yes. I, 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 yeah. Like it's a it's a very kind of like tab not taboo book. The Everyone lifestyle thing, the lifestyle, yeah, business, yeah. But what does that actually mean? Yeah. So I think, I mean, to to a degree, yeah. Like I think we want to have that balance. I personally want to have that balance, and I want to be around, hanging out with the kids, 
that sort of thing. So looking at how I spend my time has been really, really important. And I, I like the idea of startup. I like the idea of like really pushing hard on things. Uh, but I've been like just more and more indoctrinated into the whole like 37 signals kind of like stay up, I think Jason Fried calls it, that we're trying to build a profitable business that we can keep around for a while. And if at some point an opportunity comes around and someone wants to purchase one of the products that we have, yeah. you know, open to anything, but going to be very deliberate with it, I think. And that's, that's kind of the, the approach that we're taking with this. Okay. And then what, what, what are you looking, um, basically, what are, what, what's the most exciting bit for you that you're looking for as, as this business grows? What excites you about it? This, this is probably going to sound kind of, kind of corny, but I actually, I really like helping people in, in whatever capacity I, I can. It's not to me, that it, doesn't sound corny. Okay. I, that's, <laughs> that's my life goal as well. <laughs> so, I mean, and, and if you can do it through a product, like I, I believe in the product that we have, we are using our own product, right? And so I can see what it can do for other people. And I, I would love to just have stacks of user stories, case studies, um, testimonials that say, yep, with this, we were able to 10 X our revenue, whatever it is, you know, like we, our conversion doubled, our churn dropped, it was cut in half, you know, like that to me is the most exciting part. Like if you can see those wins for, for other people, that means that we're doing well, but also I just, that that's the most fun part to me mm -hmm. is like, we're providing something of value and yeah, I, Maybe it is, maybe it's not corny, but yeah, to me, it feels a bit like that. Like it's mm. a bit, it's a bit trite to say like, I'm just here to help, but that, that is what excites me about this in, in providing these tools is if we can help other people grow their business, then yeah. that's, that's awesome. I think nowadays a lot of us do start businesses because of that. And you know, it's especially product businesses mm. you're trying to help people. Yeah. Um, as, as much as you can. I mean, I think, I think there's definitely founders out there that fixate over a specific problem as in that's what they love the, the solving that specific problem mm -hmm. more than in general, helping people. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, um, think of Elon Musk, right? Mm -hmm. So he's like, he has a lot of things that he's a lot of, um, I don't want to put it in a very uh, odd way, but he, it seems like he's fixated on a couple of topics yeah. and you know, that works out for him. That's what he loves and likes to do and so on. I don't think I'm like that. I think I've never had a, okay, I want to solve this problem in the world specifically. Yeah, I see yeah. More of a, if I have a contribution, I'm fulfilled, I'm satisfied, yeah. I'm happy. Um, and it sounds like you're, in, you're the same. Yeah, I mean, I, I think this company is a vehicle to do that. Like that's yeah. how I look at it. And I, I, I believe that there is a problem there that we can solve. And so right now fixated on that, but yeah, at a, in a bigger picture sense, yeah, it's more like, how can we help yeah. that sort of thing, which is also dangerous I find because I'm, I often feel compelled to like, yeah, I'll get on a call, you know, and maybe I shouldn't be spending so much time on phone call. <laughs> it's like, I've got a job to do as well that, you know, like at some point I need to find that balance where if anyone wants to ask questions, I'm happy to, yeah, absolutely. Oh, that's let's a, go. Th but, that's a topic that we could be chatting about for a long time because uh, I know exactly what you're talking about. We love, we still love, but in the early days of Jigsaw, we were on all kinds of calls with everyone that had a, a simple question or a plethora of questions. And we had to figure out how to kind of like scale that down because we realized Nikki was spending most of her week in demo calls and and customer um, success calls. Yeah. Right? Um, so there's a balance to be had there. Or although you enjoy it, I enjoy it as well. She she was enjoying it as well. It's like okay, so I you know I shouldn't be talking to to customers 24 seven, although I love to talk to them, it's still like you have to somehow limit it and, and be smart about, you know, how you help them. Yeah. Yeah. Instead of my regular three questions, I'm going to ask you 
one single question, which I'm quite interested in. Being through this period of starting this business, what would be one question, like not one question, sorry, one piece of advice that you would give anyone that's maybe a step or two behind? Let's say they're just getting started. They're just at the con concept stage. They're just putting together the, the initial thoughts of their uh, product business. Mm -hmm. What would be one advice that you'd give that person? Oh, wow. Okay. You said you're going to go easy on me. <laughs> uh. Well, I switch <laughs> instead of three questions, I give you one. I get one. Harder. All right. Yeah. Uh, what would what, advice? I, I don't know if I'm in a position to give advice to anybody, to be honest, uh, but, but that is, um, can I say that's bullshit? And you know why? <laughs> well, because we, we tend to think that the people that should advise us are these very successful individuals that have been, you know, they're a thousand steps ahead and been through all of it, done everything, tried everything. But as I was growing up as a founder at Jixo, I realized how beneficial it is for others to to even learn from someone that's one, two steps ahead. Yeah. And that's I, more relatable. I appreciate closer. that framing of the question too. Yeah. And I, I, I'm with you on that one. So I think it, in that context, one of the things that I think I've had to learn myself recently, and, and I, I'm, I'm constantly sort of fighting myself on this, is I want to be across everything in the company. And we've got, you got a team for a reason, and we've decided who's responsible for which areas of the business. And for me, it's kind of, it's not so much like staying in my lane, right? It's not, it's not like stay in your lane and do nothing else. It's make sure that I, I get the financial stuff down, right? Like I've run small companies before, I, I understand it, but am I doing it properly? Am I doing that the best that I can? without getting like distracted on the product side and like, actually, I'd like to do that today. It's like, no, I've got my responsibilities here. And I think for me, it's just been the discipline to set aside the time to focus on those, those parts of the business yeah. and just say like, I own, I own the finances. Like that's, that's my responsibility in the company. So I'm actually just blocking off time every week to do that. And if it's not necessarily actively managing it, it's, are there, are there lessons that I can be learning? So going and looking, like how can I make myself better at that particular thing instead of spreading myself across the whole company? Obviously I wanna know what's going on, but um, having that conversation initially with your co-founders, if you have them or your team to say, who's responsible for what? And then how are you personally going to make sure that you're fulfilling that role? Um, so yeah, it doesn't sound like advice, but I think it's, it's more of like, know your role yeah um but just have the discipline to actually to be able to fulfill that and if you have to learn be open about it go seek those resources that's been helpful to me to say you know, like running running this kind of business there are nuances that i wasn't familiar with necessarily before i've been around it but not sitting in these you know the sort of like sitting at the the startup the founder table yeah. where it wasn't my responsibility before so I understood what someone else was doing, but now that it's mine to own, I actually, I need to go deeper on that. So it's kind of just instilling the discipline in myself to do that. And I think that would be something to maybe pass on is pick a part of the business and really own that. Yeah. I also think you're way too modest of say, not trying to not frame that as advice. I, I do think that that's really good um, advice oh, thank you. to have. And again, coming from someone that you know, if someone watching this and they're just getting started, that is a lot fresher and more uh, applicable to their state versus, you know, someone that might be already a hundred uh, million ARR right, type yeah. of business, right? Well, thank you so much. I know that you also have to run to SaaS stock, set up your yeah. booth and do all of that, <laughs> uh, all of that stuff. Um, really, really great conversation. I can't wait to I need to have Simon on mm. and Kate. Yes. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. the chat.